I think we're in a really interesting time in terms of all the structural changes that are happening in the industry. Um, over the course of the last six or seven years, we've gone through a period where um, a huge amount of capital has come into the industry, and, uh, and I would uh, personally assert that that capital that has come in is a structural change. It's come in from pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, um, hedge funds, all whom are looking at property and casualty insurance as an asset class that they want to directly participate in, not just purely from an investment perspective, but also from a risk-taking perspective. And so that, that excess capital that is you know, seeking to be risk capital, um, which started as you know, providing additional capital for catastrophe risk, and a lot of it was securitized, like with ILSs and so forth, has now made its way into first dollar and guaranteed cost risk. And that's a really interesting change. And, and in the US alone, if you just want to use like a simple benchmark of a, a dollar of premium to a dollar of capital, you know, we probably have $200 billion of excess capital in the industry. And that's after having the first and fourth largest catastrophe years in, in the history since we've, we've tracked uh, catastrophe. So capital is one really interesting thing that's happening. I think the second thing that's happening is obviously technology. And I think there's a little bit of kind of the interplay between these things where, where technology is, uh, is making it much more efficient for capital to come in. It used to be that you'd have a big cap cat event, people would go to Bermuda, you know, raise capital, start new companies. Today, people can put capital to work into the insurance market very quickly, and technology is a big part of that. But the other part of it is that with the emergence of you know, insure techs and, uh, and quite honestly with the use of technology by the incumbents, there's different models for the way that riskism is, is, um, is originated and then, and then placed to the risk capital providers. Um, look, I'll give you a, just a, a handful of really simple examples. Uh, Metro Mile, which is uh, a usage-based insurance company, their capital provider is Hudson Structured Finance, which is you know, a non-traditional source of capital to take the risk. You have really interesting models like Amwins, one of the, you know, the largest uh, wholesale broker uh, in the world who has taken a book of their business in non-standard auto. Uh, they basically created a proprietary pr product and AlphaCat, which is, um, you know, which is a non-traditional capital provider owned by AIG now. Um, is providing, you know, is providing the capital. And, you know, the, the examples go on and on that are like that. And I think that, that that kind of corresponds, you know, with one feeds the other. Um, I think more broadly, technology is just fundamentally changing the way that, um, that risk is, uh, is originated, um, how it's evaluated, how it's priced, and, and then ultimately how claims will be, you know, claims will be settled. And, um, I'm not a big believer that technology is, you know, is going to replace skilled workers like underwriters, um, you know, and, and claims adjusters. But I am a big believer that technology is going to be central to illuminating understanding of risk, such that you know a better a better decision regarding placement, better decision regarding pricing can be made. And that's going to come from you know new data sources, whether it be you know, IOT, um, you have uh, examples of high definition um, uh, aerial imagery using to use to, uh, to better understand like roof conditions. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. So there's new data sources. Uh, you know, the business that we're in is taking the, the large masses of existing data sources, much of which is unstructured, and applying um, technology, artificial intelligence, to make sense of all that unstructured data. So there's a big opportunity just to, just to harvest what's already available. Um, and, and that plays out you know, in, in lots of different ways. And I think on the claims side, um, artificial intelligence, will, get, will, be, will be an important part of you know, decision support to better understand you know, what's the appropriate value for a claim and how to ensure that you're, you're addressing a claim in advance of things that could trigger higher severity. Um, and so that's a, a second big structural change, and, and you're seeing that. You know, there's a billion and billion eight of um, investment into the insure tech space last year uh, for property and casualty. That's a big number, but if you want to put it in context of, you know, of the overall industry, it's only three percent of the global 
information technology spend uh, for property and casualty. So it's not a it's not a huge huge number in that context, but it's go growing very fast and uh, and it's. It's seeing uh, much of the deal supports coming from the industry participants themselves, the incumbents. And, and so I think that, that you're just going to see an acceleration of the role of technology in a bunch of different ways. I think the third um, big factor that's happening, and these things interplay, is that you know, the industry is um, at a point where there's a tremendous um, uh, potential diminution of talent because two-thirds of of underwriters, two thirds of claims adjusters in the U.S. are age 50 or over. Two thirds. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine a future where, where as talent moves out of our industry, that there's not a diminution of performance unless technology starts to play a role and, and starts to to, to um, uh, take some of the non-value added work that's historically been on the desks of the of, of those technical people. Provides decision support tools. Accelerates the the capabilities of the next generation. Um, so I think there's a bunch of interplay. And then the fourth major trend that I think is really interesting of what's happening is just we're at a period of time where the degree of underinsured risk um, is just accumulating, right? So, you know, people, a great example is in 2011, Tohoku, Tohoku um, uh, earthquake and, and, and tsunami in Japan, there was $200 billion of economic loss in excess of what was insured. Nobody really knows what the underinsured amount is, but but you take you know things like cyber and you take climate change driven perils like like flood, um, you know you take a look at the the global connectivity of our supply chain and there's just a, a you know contingent business interruption. There's a huge amount of underinsured risk. And again, here's a here's an instance where you have you have capital that wants to you know be put to work, and you have technology that is developing at a speed and in a way that. Your ability to understand risk takes supply chain, knowing exactly where goods are throughout the supply chain. Years ago, that wasn't that wasn't possible. Today, that becomes more possible, um, and so I think that there's an interplay of all four of these things that um, that make the moment in time that we're at right now for the insurance industry really interesting.